It makes no sense to say there was only one origin of Homo sapiens. The genus Homo evolved in Africa, but as soon as they left the continent, all bets are off because evolution is going to treat every population differently, said Sheila Athreya, a biological anthropologist at Texas A&M University, in a recent interview with Live Science. This idea reflects a growing shift among researchers who are re-examining the human fossil record of Asia. For most of the 20th century, discoveries from Jokudian near modern Beijing were confidently placed within the category of Homo erectus. They were thought to represent a primitive stage of humanity, heavy-browed, thick-boned, small-brained, and stuck somewhere on the path between ape and modern human. Yet modern research, fresh excavations and detailed analyses of the artifacts found alongside these fossils tell a far more complex and compelling story. The people known as Peking Man may not represent a primitive dead end. They may instead represent an early form of Homo sapiens, or perhaps the mysterious Denisovans. Their behavior, tools and cultural development reveal a sophistication inconsistent with the older view that they were a dull, simple hunter-scavenger. Their world suggests intelligence, innovation and adaptability that align more closely with modern humans than with the image once painted of Homo erectus. Some anthropologists argue that once early humans left Africa, they travelled across Eurasia and experienced different environments that shaped their evolution in multiple directions. Under this model, populations could have evolved separately and later merged. This means there may not have been a single place where modern humans emerged. Asia, in particular, appears to have produced its own long-lasting lineages. Rather than being replaced by later newcomers, these Asian lineages may have continued, changed over time, and contributed to later populations. In this picture, Peking Man becomes more than an evolutionary footnote. He may be a direct participant in the ancestry that eventually leads to today's humans. The Jokudian site southwest of Beijing preserves dozens of hominin remains. The assemblage includes around 40 incomplete skeletons and is surrounded by a rich collection of animal fossils, including giant deer, hyenas, and saber-toothed cats. These bones were originally attributed to a subspecies of Homo erectus, Homo erectus pekinensis, though some researchers now believe the remains reflect a far more advanced hominin. One skullcap discovered in 1929 became a defining symbol of Peking man. These individuals lived several hundred thousand years ago, long before the period traditionally associated with the arrival of Homo sapiens in East Asia. Yet their behavior suggests that they may have been closer to modern humans than once believed. The cave contains the story of both Jukudian man and Jukudian woman. She lived 500,000 years ago, and she was not beautiful by our standards. The facial reconstruction required giving her a much thicker neck than any modern woman. Both the back of the skull and the powerful, chinless jaw revealed muscle attachments that made such a neck unmistakable. Similarly, the cheeks had to be shaped to fit the muscle mass required to operate that heavy jaw. Brow ridges were extremely prominent on the species, including their women. The Jokudian skulls show a low, somewhat flat arch from forehead to back, along with a marked brow ridge. For decades, this was regarded as proof of primitiveness, Yet heavy brow ridges and sloping skull vaults can be found among many robust early Homo sapiens in Africa and Europe. The neck musculature and jaw strength of Jokudian individuals indicate powerful chewing muscles. The jaw lines lack chins. These features were once thought uniquely archaic, but the physical variation within the human lineage is now understood to be much broader than previously assumed. Even brain volume does not clearly separate Peking man from later humans. Brain capacity ranged around 1,000 to approximately 1,200 cubic centimeters, within the lower range of modern human variation. The overall body plan of these individuals appears essentially modern. Estimates based on femur length suggest an average height of roughly 5 feet 4 inches. They walked upright, traveled long distances, and hunted game animals. They carved out a place for themselves in a harsh Ice Age environment. Their bones do not describe a hunched brute, but a fully upright person capable of long journeys over rugged terrain. The truest measure of humanity, however, is not mere appearance. It lies in behavior. 
In the deep layers of the cave, charred bones and ash clusters indicate that these people controlled fire. Hearths appear in the form of what look like domestic activity floors, suggesting zones where families gathered around flames for warmth and cooking. This represents one of the greatest leaps in human history. Fire provides warmth, protection and nourishment. It must be tended and preserved. Fire in this context suggests teaching, learning and cultural transmission across generations. Fire alone would be enough to distinguish these hominins from the simple caricature once drawn of them. But the evidence does not stop there. Microscopic analysis of stone tools recovered from the site shows that many were used for woodworking. Although wooden tools themselves do not survive, the stones record their actions in the form of tiny scratches, depressions and polish. These people shaped wooden implements, perhaps spears or other working tools. Woodworking requires planning, deliberate movement, and familiarity with the qualities of different materials. Other tools show signs of hide processing. These marks indicate that they scraped, softened, and pressed animal skins. The careful treatment of hides suggests the manufacture of clothing. This activity involves repeated actions, complex movements of the hands, and shared knowledge. Clothing is more than protection from cold. Clothing implies that these humans recognized the need to prepare for seasonal change, to think ahead, and to care for themselves and one another. This alone places them firmly within the realm of thoughtful humans rather than instinct-driven automatons. Speaking of Homo erectus's culture or civilization may seem strange in light of what we know about his appearance and way of life. Nonetheless, he had a distinct culture level, albeit a primitive one. He knew how to make stone implements for cutting wood and foraging in the earth, as well as for hunting and fighting with his own species. In his humble way, Chinese Homo erectus could make tools such as stone knives and hatchets for his chores. Stone tools were not simply held in the hand. Some appear to have been attached to sticks to create composite tools including spears. This technique, known as hafting, demands foresight and coordinated skill. Two different materials must be shaped and united. This requires a mental blueprint. The maker must imagine the completed object before it exists, then take steps to construct it. The spear transforms from a simple stone flake into a longer, more effective tool. Such a composite weapon allows hunting at a distance and sharper control of movement. It represents an intellectual advance ordinarily associated with later Homo sapiens. Other tools appear to have been modified for engraving, some were used to drill holes into unknown materials. The purpose of this drilling remains a mystery. Whether for ornamentation, tool-making, or some unknown cultural practice, the activity suggests complex thought. Drilling is a precise action. It represents controlled pressure, repeated rotation, and intention. The very idea of drilling suggests exploration. Someone imagined the possibility of perforation, tested it, and performed it again. This kind of curiosity belongs firmly within the human realm. The stone tool industry of Jokudian includes knives and hatchets. These tools supported hunting, foraging, woodworking and hide dressing. Far from being passive scavengers, these people hunted with skill. Their tools display a deliberate emphasis on tasks beyond simple cutting. The sophistication reflected in their technology places them far above the earlier stereotype of Homo erectus. Advanced behavior suggests an advanced mind. New excavations have revealed preserved surfaces inside the cave that resemble living spaces. These include hardened layers that may represent hearth floors. The layout implies social organization. Individuals likely shared tasks, prepared food together, and coordinated group hunts. The presence of hearths and tool workshops speaks to a settled rhythm of life. One imagines families huddled around glowing embers in winter children learning from adults, and hunters crafting their weapons before heading into the cold forests beyond. Although it remains impossible at present to recover DNA from the Jokudian fossils because of their age and long burial history, a growing number of experts suspect that these individuals may have belonged to the Denisovan population. A Denisovan skull, uncovered elsewhere, resembles East Asian Homo erectus skulls so closely that some scholars now believe they may represent the same broad population. If so, 
the people of Joe Kudian may not have been replaced by later Homo sapiens. Instead, they may have contributed genes to later Asian populations. This blurs the distinction between archaic and modern. It suggests that evolution in Asia was not a simple chain of replacements, but an interwoven network of populations that changed together, traded knowledge, and interbred. The recent reconstruction of the Jungsian fossils, which have been interpreted to lie close to the split between Homo sapiens, Denisovans, and Neanderthals, suggests that Asia was a second cradle of humankind. Java man, who is closely related to Jungsian man, may even give up his genetic secrets soon, or even Peking man himself, which would blow the doors off the out-of-Africa theory. If the Jokudian people were early Homo sapiens, or Denisovans closely related to them, then the Asian story becomes much deeper and more multifaceted. The old view that all modern humans sprang from a single source in Africa and replaced other hominins is no longer sufficient. Asia is not a stage for late arrivals. It is itself a birthplace of human development. Once humans began to leave Africa, they entered new landscapes that shaped their evolution in new directions, leading eventually to the variety of humans who mixed and merged over hundreds of thousands of years. In this vision, Peking man is not a primitive cousin. He is part of the human family, a fully capable participant in the long journey of our species. He controlled fire, processed hides into clothing, shaped wood, drilled materials for unknown purposes, and crafted composite spears. He lived in organized shelters and inhabited a rich landscape. His world was not empty. It was alive with predators, forests, seasons, and change. He walked upright, hunted in groups, and learned from his elders. A thick neck and heavy brow do not diminish these achievements. The people of Jokudian deserve recognition not as crude, half-formed beings, but as members of a lineage that shaped the world around them with ingenuity and perseverance. They remind us that human evolution was not linear. It was a braided river, with branches merging and separating over time. Peking man flowed within this river, not outside it. His story is our story. Most importantly, he was familiar with the use of fire, and anthropology considers this discovery to be the greatest single step forward in the history of humanity. So take him as you find him, beneath the thick neck, cannibalism and all. Despite his flaws, after all, Jokudian man was still human. Thank you for watching and please click on our other videos if you enjoyed this information and like and subscribe.